Okay, welcome to this session on performing chaos in a serverless world. Uh, my name is uh, Gunnar Grosch, or Gunnar Grosch, if you want to be American. Um, this is a session that's going to be quite quick in the beginning, and then we're going to do a demo at the end. But first, just set the stage. Uh, chaos engineering is nothing new. Uh, just a show of hands, how many know of chaos engineering? Okay, a few at least. So, it has been used for a couple of years, or a few years, uh, but now when we are working with serverless, we have introduced some new issues that we need to find ways to, to solve by using chaos engineering. So this is what we'll cover. First, what chaos engineering is, then how to run your chaos experiments, and then what those challenges that we're facing when we're using chaos engineering in serverless. And then at the end, as I said, uh, a quick demo using a serverless chaos experiment. So first, uh, resiliency is what we're talking about. And a resilient system is a system that's highly available and it's a durable system so that it can withstand um, issues uh, and still have an acceptable level of service when failure occurs. So we need to accept that failure will happen, but the system needs to be able to handle this failure. So first short about me. Uh, I work at a company called Opsio in Sweden. Uh, I have a background in development uh, and operations. Um, I am an organizer of AWS user groups in Sweden. Uh, also, a serverless meetup in Sweden. Uh, I also organize the upcoming serverless days in Stockholm, as well as the AWS Community Day in the Nordics. Um, I have three kids. I'm divorced, so I know all about chaos. <laughs> so what is chaos engineering? This is the go-to slide when we talk about chaos engineering. Every chaos engineering session has this. So chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. So chaos engineering is not about breaking things. It's often used in that way. Let's break things. But chaos engineering isn't about breaking things. Chaos engineering is about performing controlled experiments to inject failure into a system. Chaos engineering is about finding the weakness in a system and fixing them before they break. No one wants to be the guy that needs to go up at 2 in the morning to fix a problem. It's better to find the problem before it happens in real life. Chaos engineering is about building confidence in your system, but also about building confidence in your organization so that you know that your system can withstand turbulent conditions, but also that your organization can withstand turbulent conditions. No. 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 So let's, let's reset. Let's reset. OK. So, okay, we back up, do it again. Someone, someone hold Alex. Um, so I was talking, we saw the screen, I think you were pointing, and then we see Mr. Werner Vogels. So that's the thing, everything fails all the time. That's, this is the second thing that's in every chaos engineering presentation. And uh, the, the quote from Werner Vogels. So, we shouldn't, happen, shouldn't ask what happens if a system fails. Instead, we should ask what happens when it fails. Every system will fail eventually. So, running chaos in, uh, experiments then. First off, why? Why do we run chaos experiments? Well, are your customers getting the experience they should? Or is the system behaving in a way that the system or the customers don't like? Uh, is downtime or issues costing your money? Uh, are you confident in 
your monitoring and the alerting so that if an issue occurs, that your team, your ops team, will be able to get alerts and uh, act on them accordingly. And the last thing, is the organization ready to handle outages? Is your development team, your DevOps team, operations team, are they ready to, to handle a big outage? So when we do chaos engineering, we work in a few steps. The first step is to define the steady state. We need to know how should the system behave. So what is the, the normal behavior of the system? And to do that, we need some metrics. Uh, normally, we have system metrics in different ways, so we know how the, the system behaves. But we also have business metrics, and the business metrics are, are usually more useful. Um, business metrics might be how many logged in users are there, uh, how many things are bought from the e-commerce site, and so on. Um, and we need to be aware of that the steady state isn't always uh, continuous. So things might happen so that the steady state that you're used to uh, might be different on the next day. Black Friday is a good example, of course. The next, next thing is that we, we form what we call a hypothesis. Uh, and the hypothesis is uh, we ask questions, uh, usually in the form of what ifs. What if we have a problem with system X? What if um, we have latency in our system? What if Bob is on vacation? Uh, we can inject chaos on any layer in the stack. And that can be the technical layer with the infrastructure, it can be on the code layer, and it can be on the human level. So remove Bob from the equation and see what happens. Can anyone in the organization solve the issue? When we do the hypothesis, we first need to fix the known problems. If we ask questions and we know that it's going to be an issue, then it's no use in running that experiment. We stop, we fix the problem, and then we go back to creating a new hypothesis. Next step is to plan and run our experiment. Uh, we whiteboard it so we know in detail what's going to happen. We make sure to contain the blast radius. That is, we shouldn't perform large experiments to begin with. We, we start with the smallest possible experiment and then go from there. Make sure that everyone in the organization knows that we're going to do experiments, uh, and we make sure to have a stop button. So if we run an experiment, we need to be able to abort if everything goes, um, goes not so well. Then we, we have run our experiments, then we need to measure and learn from it. So we look at the metrics that we had initially, and we see what happened when we did our experiment. Was the system resilient? Could it, uh, could it withstand the failure that we injected? And not, uh, it's not uncommon that we find unexpected things when we do the experiments. So ask yourself, did something unexpected happen? And an important thing using chaos engineering is um, I mentioned earlier that we should notify the organization. When we've done our experiment, make sure to let everyone know what happened. So it's not a blame game, not to find someone to point to, but to know, uh, for everyone in the organization to know that the system behaves in a specific way. And then, as the last step, we scale up. I said that we should contain the blast radius. Well, the next step then is to, to enlarge the blast radius. So if we only started with one single function, for example, next step can, might be to inject failure in several functions or several containers or whatever we run the exper experiment on. Uh, when we increase the scope, we usually find new things. We find new revelations uh, in the environment. So when do we get to the serverless part? Uh, now is the time for the serverless part. So, we have new challenges in the chaos engineering space when it comes to serverless. And those challenges, I, I think you're familiar with most of them. Uh, we have no servers to manage. That's good for you. It's bad for a chaos engineer, because the easy way to run an experiment it is to shut down a server, shut down a container, or things like that. And uh, we don't have servers to manage. We don't have uh, any heavy lifting that's done by the cloud provider. That means that we also lose control 
and control is a way to, uh, to do our experiments. So when we don't have control, we can't do those types of experiments. There are lots and lots and lots of services. And that means that we need to find ways for each and every service, if we want to, to, to run our experiments. Um, and that makes it a bit trickier. We also have configuration per function. Uh, so for each and every function, we can do different types of experiments. And the architecture um, is, as most of you are aware of, quite granular. So we have lots of functions, usually in a big serverless application. And that means that we have a lot of more complexity, but also inherent chaos in the architecture. So it's open for chaos at the get-go. So a few common serverless weaknesses that we, uh, we might see. Uh, there might be missing error handling. Uh, that's something that we usually find when we do chaos experiment, that when we inject failure, the, ha the error that occurs isn't really handled in a proper way. Um, timeout values in uh, functions uh, might be uh, incorrect. They're built for best case scenario, which is most of the time. But if we inject latency, we might experience problems with the timeout values. Uh, it's not always that we have fallback, that if something fails, we have fallback to something else. Uh, we're talking, often we're talking about graceful degradation. If something fails, uh, it shouldn't affect the user in the way that they see an error message. They should see something that looks quite nice. Netflix uh, is a good example here. Netflix created chaos engineering in the begin beginning. Um, in their interface, they have graceful degradation in the way that if something fails, they just remove that part from the UI. So if you don't see the part that says um, new releases, well, it might be because they have an issue with the new releases uh, microservice. Missing regional failover. Um, that, I think that's quite common, that uh, we don't build all systems for regional failover. So if we have a regional issue, uh, the application might not work. So, looking at some serverless chaos experiments based on this. Uh, welcome to the serverless chaos demo app. Quite easy application, or the architecture is. Uh, it's a website that uses static content from an S3 bucket. Uh, it has an API gateway with two different uh, Lambda functions behind. Um, you might see from this what's, what we're going to do with it. One is normal, one is latency. And then we have a Dynamo DB table. Uh, what happens here is that uh, it's a web page which loads images. And the uh, images are reloading on, I think, five second basis. And each time it invokes the Lambda function, which then gets the data from the Dynamo DB table with the URL to the image, which is stored in S3. So, um, we can do quite a lot in this type of environment. Uh, we can inject an errors in the code using error injection. So that means that we, we add a snippet of code in your Lambda function, which, for example, might mean that one in 10 requests throw an error. And then you need to find out, does my application support this? Does it work in the way that it was intended? This is something that we then can have a stop button, so we can turn it on and off using a par parameter or a variable. So we can have that in the code all the time, but we can just, um, just put it on when we need to. We can, of course, alter the concurrency of the functions. So um, that is, we can set how many invocations can be running at the same time. Uh, and by doing that in something that perhaps needs to have multiple uh, concurrent functions running, uh, we might uh, create an error in the, in the architecture. We can, have, of course, restrict the capacity of the DynamoDB table, the read and writes, and uh, see how our application handles that. Um, and we can add configuration errors. For example, we can add security policies that restrict the access to the S3 bucket. And, and by doing that, we can see how does my application behave 
uh, when it doesn't have the access that it's supposed to have. Um, course configuration, uh, see how the application behaves when it's not allowed to, to call uh, from the front end to the API gateway, for example. And then we have what we're going to look at now, latency injection. Uh, by adding latency to our functions, we're able to simulate cold starts, for example. And we can see how does our function behave when the cold start is worst possible. We can also uh, simulate a cloud provider issue. Um, it happens every now and then that the cloud provider has issues, so we can simulate that in a controlled fashion. We can, of course, also inject latencies so that it simulates runtime or code issues. Um, but we can also simulate integration issues so that we add latency to an integration between a third-party service or something like that. Um, and the timeouts, as I mentioned earlier. By adding latency, we can check that our timeouts work in the way we want them to, so that uh, we don't end up with, with errors there. Yang Kui wrote an article on this uh, a while back, and he published some sample code that has been used by several since. Uh, and Adrian Hornsby from AWS built a Lambda layer uh, using those IDs. So that is publicly available to be able to test, and that's when it, what we're going to do now. Um, so going back to the hypothesis then, so what if my function takes X amount of milliseconds extra for each invocation? What if timeouts occur? So the hypothesis is my app can handle that latency inject and injected on a function level. I can be honest with you and say that I don't think it will. Uh, as I said before, we shouldn't run an experiment if we think that it will fail, but shh, let's not tell anyone outside this room. So let's do it. Um, how much time do we have? A lot? That's great. Yeah, that's good, I think. Uh, so, first in the Lambda console, uh, I have uh, one of the functions here, and in that I have added the Lambda layer that Adrian Hornsby created, uh, a chaos injection layer. What it does is that it takes a parameter from, from parameter store, uh, and you can use uh, the values in that parameter to specify the amount of delay you want and if it's enabled or not. So if I invoke this function right now, when is enabled is false, it won't have any latency. But I can enable it easily, and then I will get um, um, latency in the function. So let's open. Serverless. Here we go. So this is the page. Um, I'm only missing the blinking lights uh, or the blinking text. Uh, otherwise, you can see that my front-end skills are from the 90s. So three, six images. Three on the top are using the normal function, and the three at the bottom are using the latency function. So they reload on, on I think, five-second interval. So let's then inject some chaos. Uh, and since this is stored in parameter store, it's quite, quite easy to just use uh, the CLI to update it. Uh, we can, for example, add 500 milliseconds. There we go. And now it, it should take half a second longer for each invocation. Um, that's hard to see, so let's add two seconds. Now it should start to oh, be a bit slower in the latency items. Doesn't really keep up because each invocation takes two seconds longer. Uh, so far, it isn't really a problem. Uh, what we can do next then is to add uh, or change the timeout value. We have a three second timeout right now. So if I change this to, on the function to two seconds, 
that means that the latency will be longer than the timeout value. So it will probably not work for the function to be able to call the DynamoDB table and then get the appropriate data in return. Yeah, and that seems to happen. So uh, what this means is that the, the function just times out. Uh, and in this case, I would say that my, my UI perhaps handles it in a good way. The, the user isn't presented with uh, any error messages, but it doesn't, it doesn't give them the service that they wanted, which is nice images. So that's a simple or two simple ways of injecting chaos into serverless. Let's go back here. And here we go. So, um, by using these types of, of things to do chaos experiments, we're able to, to take what is really uh, managed services where we don't have access in the way that we do with traditional infrastructure, but still do chaos experiments. And, and the goal, as I said, is to find out if my application handles the issues that we throw at them. This was done by using simple things that you can build yourself, but there are tools as well. Gremlin is a company that has a SaaS service for chaos engineering. They have a separate product that's called Alfi that is for chaos injecting into code, which can be used for serverless functions. Chaos Toolkit is an open source project uh, which is built around extensions or add-ons, which has AWS support and a Lambda support, so you can add uh, latency, for example, into Lambda functions as well. Uh, and, and Tundra uh, have added functionality in their system, which now helps you to add chaos experiments directly into the, the solution that you're monitoring or observing using their tool. But the best bet, as I said, is to build your own. That's easy. Okay, so the summary is this. It's not about breaking things. It's about building confidence. And we have some new challenges, but anyone can do it. Take a photo if you want to have the links. Uh, follow Serverless Chaos on Twitter. Um, and join the Chaos Engineering Slack. and some people in the business that has inspired all of this. So, thank you very much.